My name is Dr. Stephen E. Gardner, and I want to welcome you to today's episode of Talking Points. The last few weeks, we have dealt with the topic or the theme, I should say, post-resurrection reflection. And there have been some building blocks that have been that have been laid for those who are Christ followers and for those who wish to draw from the Christian faith. Let me tell you this. Now that the foundation is laid, how are we going to build? How are we going to move forward? What kind of words, what kind of insight can we draw from that's going to speak to where we are in life? What kind of tools must I pull out or must I discover that's going to help me to get to where I need to be? Having said that, this set of series that I'm going to talk about can speak to all of us, whether we are business owners or whether we are professionals in life or whether we are ministers of the gospel or just people in general. Whatever it is that you intend to do, wherever it is that you want to go, it's important and imperative that we become what I would consider passion-driven. Passion-driven. And so in today's episode, part one, Passion Driven, we're talking about this. I've got to do something about this. Now, when a person is passionate about something, they do something to make the difference. They do something to make the change. In fact, I've heard people talk about, well, a person was just sick of being sick. So they did something. And sometimes we have to get basically fed up with our mundane life, fed up the way things have been, fed up the way things are, and make up in our own mind that we're going to do something to make the difference. So what is it? What drives you? What are you passionate about? Passion not only talks about, you know, uh, that emotion that, that, that fuels you know, the direction that you're going. But passion is also maybe something that you personally have a particular interest in and are very, very enthusiastic about that. Well, whether it's the emotion or whether it's a particular interest, if you want to change, if you want to do something about what it is that you see, you've got to put that passion in drive. Become passion driven, become that individual that that become well, whether it's hell or high water, nothing is going to stop you from achieving the goal. Nothing's going to stop you from at least pursuing to move in the direction that you're going. Let me say this. Not everybody is going to be, you know, is going to be passionate just like you are. Sometimes in being passionate about a particular thing means that you're going to have less friends, means that everybody's not going to buy into that which, you know, that which floats your boat, that which motivates your motor, that what moves your life the way it is currently directed. Being passion driven means that there is nothing in front of you or on the peripheral or even behind you that stops you from saying, I've got to do something about this. Let's look at this uh, quote by Jennifer Lee. She said, be fearless in pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. Be fearless in pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. What sets your soul on fire? Whatever it is, guess what? You got to become fearless about. Remember I told you that it be, that moving in pursuit of what sets your soul on fire, moving in the direction of your passion or what's driving you means that you may not have as many friends means that everybody may not feel as passionate about what it is that you feel. But regardless of their buy-in or lack of buy-in, 
I must become fearless because sometimes in moving forward, there are going to be times that I'm going to feel like that I'm alone. But even when I feel like that I'm alone, there's a feeling inside me that's moving me because why? What's in front of me has set my soul on fire. What I see has made me excited. What I see has moved, has put my life in a gear to where I'm not going to look back, but rather I'm going to look forward. I'm going to do something about this. When we begin to look at some definitions and descriptions of passion and passion driven, first of all, I guess the most common place to look is Merriam Webster's collegiate dictionary. Passion means intense driving or overmastering feeling or conviction. Passion means intense driving or it's an overmastering feeling of conviction. In other words, if I'm passion driven, then there's a feeling that has that's kind of overtaken me. I, I, I'm, I'm looking, as it were, to, to, to move heaven and earth because of what I feel very strong about. There are people that feel strong about certain things, but yet they feel strong at the moment, but then it fleets away. People that can stay with it and finish the course are the individuals that are able to get beyond the atmosphere of complacency and comfort and mediocrity and soar to that, that, that level by which I'm going to finish and I intend to finish well. A passion driven person is not going to be a person that's going to be like those booster rockets that stick, stay on as long enough till you get outside the atmosphere and fall off. A passion driven per, uh, person is an individual that even when it does not seem to have the, the support from others has found an inner support from a, from a purpose as it were, that's driving them in a direction that says, I've got to do something about this. Let's consider Eliana Love. She's the CEO of Purpose Link Consulting, and you probably should look her up because, you know, you know her company is, is phenomenal in what they're doing with consulting. Well, her firm did some research that revealed that purpose and passion are integrally linked, like two strands of DNA that comprise the code for life. Purpose and passion are integrally linked like the two strands of DNA that comprise the code for life. So let's think about that for a moment. My passion and my purpose are integrated. Wherever there, whatever your purpose is, there's a passion that's linked to it. On the other hand, whatever I'm passionate about, there's a purpose that's linked to it as well. So whatever the code of your life is, whatever the definition of your life is, whatever it is that you are to be doing or whatever it is that you're doing, there are two strands that are basically interwoven in your DNA. And those two strands that are interwoven in your DNA your code for life that comprise your code for life is purpose and passion. Everybody has a purpose and everybody has a passion. And if I'm lacking in purpose, then I need to ignite it with passion. If I'm lacking in passion and don't know what to do with all this energy, then I need to connect it with a purpose. Either way, passion, and purpose are interdependent, as it were, that what? Comprise the code for life. We can't accomplish anything without it. We can't do anything without it as well. Let me say this. There are some things in life, when we think about the statement, I've got to do something about this. There are some things in life that says, 
you know what? It's up to me to make the difference. It's up to me to change things. Too often, I believe, people of faith have been limited in how they consider their faith. We've taken the definition of faith and we have limited the definition of faith to only be associated with believing for something to come into existence. And although I believe that faith is that ingredient that enables what we hope for to come into existence, but faith is far more than just a utilitarian aspect to get what I hope for by believing that God will give it. Faith is also the ability to see that something needs to happen and I'm the one to make it happen. In other words, I've got to do something about this. And so when I begin to move in that direction, that says that I have faith. And especially when that thing that, it, that I'm supposed to be doing or the thing that I wish to happen is tied to the hands of God that God has got something to do with the way I'm being driven. And I'm standing there to say, well, well I'm, I'm going to pray that God will make this thing happen. But when I have faith in this regard, it says, God, I know you got my back. God, I know you got my front. God, I know that you're with me. And so therefore, I've got to do something about this. What is it? You that are listening to what I've got to say right now, that you see some things already that there's a change that needs to happen. And you may ask yourself the question, well, how come something's not doing something about this? Well, how come this and how come that? Maybe it's up to you to make something happen. I've got to do something about this. And that individual that makes that kind of statement that puts hands and feet so that statement is a person that has faith and corresponding action. A person that does something about what they see is a person that's passion driven and a person that also has the kind of faith and corresponding action to cause what they are passionate about to come to pass. When we read the Old Testament scripture or the Old Testament rendering, we find that it was David King David, and, he, and in one of his psalms, he said, you know, whatever my hands find to do, I will do it with all my might. Sometimes we have to be the one to get up and do what it is that needs to be done. We cannot always depend upon somebody else. We cannot always depend upon this or that. But sometimes what we see is what we see. And what we see is what we see are supposed to do and whatever we're supposed to do, I need to be driven by passion to make sure it gets done. Just like what we have been witnessing the last couple of years or so is the injustice that has been conducted and it has been the result of, uh, of, of inequities and, and, and um, a malpractice and lack of training by the police department in the killing of black and brown and yellow individuals. The point of it is here is that there are people that are out there protesting because that's what they're passionate about. There are other people that have to be the individuals that pick up the mantle after the protests have ended. There are other people that have to be in the backstory that are the supporting force to, to, to kind of make sure that certain things happen. Whether it be I'm a protester or whether I'm in the back in the background, organizing the protest or whether I see what needs to be done and I'm using the, my capacity of intellect, my capacity of, uh, my capacity of insight or my capacity of connections to make sure something happens. We're all in this together. We're all interdependent in how we get done what needs to be done or whether I'm in the forefront or in the background. I must be passionate driven in order to get what I see that needs to take occur. As Eliana explained, passion is therefore better defined as the outward expression of one's inner purpose. 
It is better defined as the outward expression of one's inner purpose. We all have an inner purpose, but yet our outward expression is basically saying to others and to ourselves, this is what I'm doing about it. I'm not just going to sit up here and talk about it and complain about it. I'm not going to be, you know, an armchair prophet, but I'm going to be a prophetic person and be go out there and do something prophetically and profoundly to make this thing come to pass, to cause that which I am passionate about to become a self-fulfilling prophecy in my own life, in my own sphere of influence, in my own work. Because why? I got to do something about this. I am passion driven. She went on to say that it's the energy that can be tapped to accomplish deeper life's goals. It's the energy that can be tapped to accomplish deeper life goals. The kind of energy, the goal that, that one extends well beyond the mundane and the material. Look, let me tell you something. We all have been there. There's times we've been bored. There's times we, uh, we recognize the mundane. And there's times that, you know, you know, we recognize and acknowledge, you know, that which we can see and that which we can touch, material. Yet, there's something inside a passion-driven individual that whether they have the material or whether it's redundancy, their passion moves them beyond those feelings, moves them beyond those limitations to find some kind of way to bring to pass that which they see, that which they've said. I've got to do something about this. When we talk about being made in the image and likeness of God, you know, some people have dumbed it down to be because God's a spirit, I'm a spirit, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But let's think about some of the characteristics of what God is. God's love. So therefore, love is God. Or let's think about God as creativity, and therefore, creativity is God. God is this creative energy that's out there somewhere and around us that we are made in that image and in that likeness. This creative energy says, when I've got to do something about it, I'm not going to sit around and wait for somebody else to do it. It's up to me to make the difference. I'm going to be driven by my passion and I'm going to become creative. Now, this is talking to somebody. Some of you are right now faced with some opportunities or is faced with some mundane, maybe it's a mundane job or you're just tired of doing what you're doing and it just seems like you're getting nowhere. Sometimes in the midst of the mundane and the lackluster, I've got to become creative. I've got to, I got to deep, I got to delve into, I got to tap into that deep energy within the recesses of my spirit and become passion driven and say, I'm going to change this. I've got to do something about this and therefore I will do it. So let's not stop because we see a stop sign. Okay, that's a stop sign. So I'm going to park, put my car in park that's here. But a stop sign is just there long enough to permit traffic to go the other way. Now that the traffic is permissible, will you get up? Will you put it in gear? Will you move beyond the stop sign? And will you get out there and do what it is that you should have been doing all along? There are many things we, that, that are many passions, there are many things that, are, that we are aware of that we should have been doing it all along, but we didn't have the right kind of catalyst. We didn't have the right kind of spark. We didn't have the passion. Passion is therefore better defined as the outward expression of one's inner purpose. We need to have that overmastering feeling of conviction to make something happen. Understanding this, your passion and your purpose are integrated and they comprise the code for your life. 
Well, I want to sum up our time today and just give you a tidbit from the story of Nehemiah in the Hebrew Scriptures because they reveal several important takeaways that correlate with a person who is passion driven. And if we respect the authority of scripture, we can find truths that can speak to right where we are and reveal the tools needed to get where we need to go. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter one, verses one through four whatever version that you're reading from. Well, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it starts out by saying this, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, one of my brothers, Han Han Hanani, came with certain men from Judah and asked about the Jews that survived those who escaped the captivity and about Jerusalem. They replied, the survivors there in the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been destroyed. When I heard these words, Nehemiah said, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now here we find Nehemiah, he was somewhere away from this circumstance and his family, one of his own brothers came and reported to him the outcome of his question. The outcome of his question was what? That those who escaped captivity, guess what? They're in great trouble and shame. And he said that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been destroyed. Surely the picture that his brother painted was a sad state of affairs. Yet what Nehemiah did, when he heard these words, he sat down and then he wept. And he mourned for days, fasting and praying before God. And so this moved him to a place of prayerfulness. Well, let's look at this a little bit further. Nehemiah's passion by the news that were reported from him was incited rather. Nehemiah's passion was incited by the news that was reported to him from his family. Sometimes family or a family member can be the source or catalyst that underlines our purpose and ignites our passion to, to fulfill it. Let me say this. You probably have heard the story of Nehemiah before, and we're going to talk about this story in the upcoming weeks or so, but no one in my, at no time do I ever recall that it was Nehemiah's family that became the catalyst that incited his passion for his purpose. Sometimes family can be the source or catalyst that underlines our purpose and ignites our passion to fulfill it. Nehemiah's passion for his people ignited a fiery prayer for something that he could change back home. There was something he could change back home. So prayer was the beginning of his difference making. Prayer was the beginning of his drive that, 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 that he became passionate about. What do you see? that's driving you to the prayer closet, not to just stop after, mo after you mourn and prayed and fasted for days, but after you've done all this praying and after you've done all this, this mourning and after you've done all this, this, this fasting, as it were, you're now in a place to where you're fueled with the ideas about how to change 
what I see. Now, what are you saying, Stephen? Sometimes when we make up in our own mind that I've got to do something about this, we also come to the place to where we assess our inventory, we look at our capacity, and we find that many times in order to, to do something about what we see, we lack the wisdom, we lack the insight, we lack the information and the direction to turn my passion into a successful enterprise. The Bible tells us these words that commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he'll bring it to pass. Notice he says, commit your way. It is a commit the ways of the Lord. It commit your interest, commit what you are passionate about, commit what you see that needs to change to whom the Lord. It's giving it to him to get the guidance we need. Acknowledge him what? In all of our ways and he will bring it to pass. So the idea is that, look, there's something that you see that needs to be done to determine whether or not you're passionate about it is to see how long it takes for you to do something about it. Do you move in that direction? Or are the things you're saying were just fleeting wind blowing out of your breath? Or are they really something substantial that says, look, I need to put my life in hyperdrive or overdrive and to begin to move in the direction to do something about what I see. I've got to do something about this. And sometimes to do something about this always begins with talking to God about that which you see. But just don't stop at talking and praying after he's given you the advice, after he's given you the wisdom, after he's given you the direction, put your passion in drive and then go and do something about what it is that needs to be done. Nehemiah's passion for his people ignited a fiery prayer for something he could change back home. What is it that you can change? What is it that needs to be changed in your own backyard? While we're looking at pointing the finger about this or that, pointing the finger about that or this, why not turn the finger around and point at your own selves, point at your own backyard, What is it in your own house that you need to get together? What is it in your own life that you need to get together? Nehemiah's passion for his people ignited a fiery prayer prayer for something he could change back home. Passion-driven people, therefore, are people of prayer. Passion-driven people, therefore, are people of prayer. Let us move on to Nehemiah chapter one, verse five through seven. And let's look at the content and the substance of this man's prayer. He said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people Israel, confessing the sins of the people Israel, which we have sinned against you. Notice you can see Nehemiah's passion, even in his prayer life, that if in Nehemiah's case, it became his lot as it were, about what he see, saw that need to happen, that it dominated his prayer life day and night. This was more than just praying a prayer of grace at the time to eat. His prayer life did not stop at the dinner table. Some of us, our prayer life stops at the dinner, ta- dinner table, and I'm not calling any names out there either. But examine where your prayer life stops and let us look at Nehemiah's prayer life, that he was at the place and point based upon what he saw, based upon what needed to occur, that he needed to pray about this 
day and night. This man's prayer life was passion driven to the point that there, that it was overtaking his day and his night with prayerfulness. Now you can see a passion driven prayer life where you're praying about something day and night. And he identified the things that were important, the things that he saw, the things where they missed as well as he himself had missed. We see that he says, both I and my family have sinned. We have offended you deeply failing to keep the commandments, the statutes and the ordinance that command that you commanded Moses. So in essence, he didn't just not park his, his, uh, his, uh, park the problem with what was outside of his family and outside of his thinking and outside of his life, but he parked it right there at home and realized that they were all involved in this offense. Sometimes we have to assess, do I play a part in this offense or am I putting the blame all on somebody else? What's my part in this? Maybe there's some time that we have our art in the wrong place and that's blocking my blessing from getting through. That's, that's stopping me from doing something about this because why? I blamed you for it, so therefore I expect you to change it. But when we begin to get a full assessment of what's occurred, we ask ourselves the question, what part do I have in this problem? And the part that I have in this problem, I've got to do something about this. The rest of the prayer, look at verses eight through 11. It says, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them a place which I have chosen to establish my name. In other words, if you're in exile and if we return to him, he'll bring us to the place that he has designed and that he has destined. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great power and your strong hand. Here we find in Nehemiah's prayer that he understood the very power of God and the power to change the problems of life and the power to change the problems of life. First of all, for the passion driven person is the assessment do I have a part in this problem? Let me change myself. Then I'm qualified to participate in the change of others. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now we find that Nehemiah is at the precipice He's at the place where not only he knew what he was passionate about, but he needed, he needed mercy in the sight of others. He needed God to do some things that will help him to do the thing that he wanted to be done. And we'll talk about that. But as we wrap this up today, here are some takeaways. Nehemiah's prayer revealed that he was informed about Yahweh's covenant with Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but in Israel's story, in Israel's history, the way that God cut a covenant was Israel was through the shedding of blood. And we find that blood sacrifice has been part and parcel of the economy of God in Israel's history. We find that when Abraham, when God cut a covenant with Abraham, he told him to divide the, the animal in half, and then that night, God, what? He was a smoking furnace that came between it to what solidified, to set on fire the covenant that God had already made with Abraham. The fact that the term cut a covenant means that blood must be shed. For Christ followers, let me tell you, God has cut a covenant with us through Jesus Christ. 
But that covenant is just not limited to just Israel and not just limited to just the people of Israel from Jesus's purview and Jesus's, you know, uh, information. But the covenant that he cut with Israel was just also a way of God saying, look, I've extended that cut. I've extended that covenant to all of humanity. And I'm offering the blood sacrifice of my son as a way of extending the blessings and privileges that I've made available in that covenant for everyone. So Nehemiah's prayer revealed that he was informed about Yahweh's covenant with Israel. The question is, am I informed about God's covenant with us through Christ? Or is my information and understanding limited? Then that's something I need to be passionate about. I got to do something about this. I've got to do something about my knowledge with the covenant that God has made possible with us through Jesus Christ. Nehemiah's prayer revealed that he was aware of his own sin and the sins of the people of Israel. It is clear from his prayer that Israel's fate was a result of a broken covenant. That is one that they broke. That is one that they fell short. Doesn't that remind you of 2 Chronicles 7, 14? That if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. He said, I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. The reason why they got themselves in that mess was because they broke covenant. The question is, have I broke a covenant with God? Am I falling short of obey obeying the things that he has revealed to us? Those things he revealed to me that I should be doing where I need to be about my father's business. This message today is for those who say, I've got to do something about this. Nehemiah not only knew the covenant, but he also knew the God of the one who cut it. Passion Driven, part one. I've got to do something about this. That's our episode today. Come back next time as we deal with part two of Passion Driven. I've got to do something about this. I trust you are blessed today. We will see you next time.